This is ABC 15 Mornings. A wildfire sparked by lightning ripping through the Tonto Forest and now some are being forced to leave their homes. And the coronavirus numbers in our state, they are slowing, but there are still so many people who are impacted financially. We're hearing from a family that is facing a number of struggles in West Phoenix. And teachers, of course, also hit hard by the ongoing pandemic. Now they're asking Governor Ducey for a new set of strict requirements for reopening schools. It continues to be a struggle that stretches through entire families. So we'll talk about that. Plus, we know that you finally made it to the weekend after a tough week. So we'll find ways to lift you up a little bit of levity on this Saturday. I'm Nohe Lani Graf. And I'm Mark Thompson working from home and we did see some monsoon action over the past couple of days. I know a lot of people this morning and since they might have been working on Friday, they're finally getting able to, uh, to being able to assess that damage and starting the cleanup process out there. Yeah, absolutely. Even on my drive in to work this morning, I did still see a few branches down here there. They'd kind of been pushed out of the way. So I think this morning we're probably going to hear a lot more chainsaws going in neighborhoods as everybody mm -hmm. gets a handle on their cleanup and it'll be a good morning to get it done. You can see our live view from one of our valley cams this morning. We've still got some clouds there. It's actually making for a beautiful sunrise this morning and we are going to get a break from those scorching temperatures for today. In fact, we're still tracking a few morning showers in portions of the valley and our storm chances do continue this weekend. Live view at clouds and radar and you can see Apache Junction is where that little storm cell is sitting right now. Portions of Fountain Hills and Mesa getting a stray shower as well. So we'll continue to track that as it continues to move up toward the northwest. So if you want to get out, get a run in this morning, our temperatures have dipped because of that cloud cover and those rain uh, chances. So we're in the 80s across much of the valley. We will warm up though by 10 o'clock. We'll be in the upper 90s and then by 2 we're getting close to our high for the day. It'll be 105 degrees. So I'll talk more about that high forecast and our continuing storm chances coming up in just minutes. All right, no, hey, thank you. 602 now on your Saturday morning. This morning we are on wildfire watch. Three fires burning in the Tonto National Forest, forcing people out of their homes. A shelter now open at Lee Carnegie School in Miami. The largest of the fires is the salt fire, which has exploded in size to now more than 20,000 acres with no containment. It was sparked by lightning earlier this week, and because of the fire, there are closures on State Routes 188 and 288, and ADOT says that there is no estimated timetable for when those roadways will reopen. And a fire crews, they are also monitoring another lightning-caused fire, this one near Wickenburg. It's the Constellation Fire spreading to 8,000 acres. We are told that the flames, uh, they are threatening several structures right now, but still no major evacuation orders are in place. And the Arizona Corporation Commission holding a emergency meeting on Friday, they wanted to make sure that our utility companies could handle all of this excessive heat that we've been experiencing over the past couple of weeks. And APS says that its service is still reliable, telling commissioners that while other places like California, California are under some level of energy emergency, APS, they were able to avoid rolling blackouts thanks to long-term planning and customers doing their part by cutting their energy usage. Time now, 6.03. Let's talk about the coronavirus. We are tracking the numbers. The state reporting 619 new cases on Friday. That brings our statewide total to nearly 197,000. So we're closing in on 200,000 cases. Four more people have died from this virus, which brings the total number of Arizona lives lost to 4,688. It's a pretty staggering number. This pandemic does continue to hit the hardest among the undocumented community. Underserved communities are feeling helpless after losing their jobs without access to public benefits or health insurance. So our ABC 15 investigator Courtney Holmes and Liliana Soto speaking to a mother in West Phoenix who is struggling to make ends meet after losing her job and having no help to care for her bedridden daughter. A hidden neighborhood in West Phoenix. That's where Clara and her 26 year old daughter have been living for the last three years. <laughs> they never had much, but always enough to get by until the pandemic took her job 
and everything else that comes with it. Para mí es muy cansado, muy estresante de que me la llevo pensando de que a veces voy a poder a completar mi renta, a veces no voy a poder a completar lo de mi luz, lo de mi comida. She owes two months of rent and electricity bills, something that's taking a toll mentally. Aunque yo esté dormida, siempre estoy pensando cómo le voy a hacer otro día. Her biggest fear? El que me eche para afuera, oiga, y, y a dónde voy a, a dar yo con mi niña. A veces me he puesto a pensar que, qué haría yo en la calle o en el carro con mi criatura. Her daughter is intellectually disabled, diagnosed with hydrocephalus, and is bedridden. She's also a dreamer, but Clara says they can't afford the application. Both of them are now left without a legal status, so they don't qualify for unemployment or disability benefits. No, no hay un día de Dios que yo no llore. Siempre le clamo a Dios por tener una vida mejor. She says she's praying for a life where she won't feel ignored, where she won't need to live in the shadows. She hopes her story can get to a government official so they won't forget that undocumented are a part of the community too. Yo le pido a Dios que lo único que le pido a Dios es que les toque su corazón y que vean la necesidad de las personas. In West Phoenix, Courtney Holmes, ABC 15, Arizona. And another group that has been hit really hard by the coronavirus pandemic, and that is teachers. And this week, they did take a stand in Arizona, uh, calling out and uh, shutting down J.L. Combs Unified School District for three days. And now this concern is not only being heard, uh, they are being acted upon by the Arizona Education Association. The organization sending a letter to Governor Ducey's office on Friday calling for a statewide COVID-19 school safety plan that includes the following, a mask mandate, canceling standardized testing, flexibility on the required 180 days of instruction, and additional funding to provide a healthy learning environment. We have to have all of the stakeholders coming together and discussing what a statewide plan looks like. What are the health benchmarks that we have to meet? What is the what are the um, protective equipment? What, what are the disinfectants that we need? How do we make sure that our, our schools can be as safe as possible? Now, State Superintendent Kathy Hoffman, they already released a roadmap to reopening plan. However, those were just recommendations and what they're asking for here are they want requirements. Meantime, more businesses are getting the green light to reopen. According to the state health department, more than 1,100 businesses applied, 95 have been approved. But what happens if counties that are currently meeting the required health benchmarks slip backwards? Dr. Kara Christ, Arizona's health director, tells our news partners at KTAR that it depends on how long a county slides. So what we're looking at is we want to see a sustained response. So if a county goes into uh, back into substantial for one week, we are not going to ask people to shut down. We're going to work with that local public health department to identify what may be going on in that community, potentially get additional testing in there. And it's not just businesses suffering. Maricopa County now has the highest number of evictions filed anywhere in the country. Princeton University actually finding 307 evictions were filed just in Maricopa County within the past week and more than 9,000 have been filed here since March 15th. Governor Ducey has extended the eviction moratorium through October 31st. So if you need help, go to maricopa.gov slash COVID rent help. All right, and here's a live look now at our nation's capital this morning. Today, lawmakers in the House, they will reconvene to vote on a bill, a bill giving more funding to the U.S. Postal Service and prevent any operational changes until after the November election. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi calling representatives back early from their August recess for this important vote. And uh, weeks after controversy, the U.S. Postmaster General Louis DeJoy facing lawmakers yesterday to address mail delays across the country. He assured the committee that the Postal Service is fully capable of delivering election mail on time. However, Democrats, they believe that the changes that DeJoy has enacted include removing uh, sorting equipment and limited overtime, that it has already had the opposite effect. These changes, they say, have since been suspended 
and the Inspector General for the Post Office is investigating DeJoy. He is scheduled to testify before another congressional hearing in the House that's coming up on Monday. Now, we mentioned the crews in our state that are battling multiple wildfires, including close to the valley. But our neighbors to the west are under a state of emergency in California. The recent storms resulting in nearly 11,000 lightning strikes, which have sparked hundreds of fires across that state. At least six people have been killed and more than 500 structures destroyed. And there is concern going into the weekend here about more thunderstorms bringing more lightning to the California area. So they are just in dire circumstances and with their excessive temperatures, they're just simply not used to what we know we can withstand here in the valley. But talking about our most accurate forecast, lightning certainly has been a, a problem for us in our state because we do still have wildfire conditions in place because of our drought conditions. So we have seen lightning cause a problem and we're still seeing some clouds this morning, but that's because we're still getting a few sprinkles and that's really what we need to balance it out. It's also dropped our temperatures. So this morning, Goodyear is down to 86 degrees. That's pretty comfortable. We're in the mid to upper 80s in Glendale, Mesa, Phoenix at 89 degrees right now. Our forecast high today, 106 degrees. So certainly not cool, but near normal and a break from those temperatures of 115, 117 that we have seen over the last two weeks. So today will be the day to get outside and, and get any of that work done that you need to because it will be more tolerable, although it will be a little more humid as well. You'll notice that as you step out the door. Right now, I am tracking some storm activity in the East Valley, just some showers, some light showers. So I'll show you that and talk about our storm chances for the rest of the weekend coming up in that full most accurate forecast. No, hey, thank you. 6-11 now on your Saturday morning coming up. A salon in the valley shares how they go above and beyond when it comes to health and safety. And more options to beat the heat as Tempe Town Lake moves along in its cleanup process. All right, well, happening today, the north side of Tempe Town Lake will reopen to the public. It's been shut down for almost a month after that Union Pacific Railroad bridge collapsed. Now you'll be able to use the park and the lake, although the south side will still be closed. Union Pacific is still clearing away debris and making some repairs. Also today, the Phoenix Rising, they're going to be taking on the Las Vegas Lights. You can watch all that action live on the CW61 Arizona. That's tonight at 730, or you can stream it live on the ABC 15 app, Roku, and these streaming devices. Time now is 615 on this Saturday morning. Let's talk about that most accurate forecast. So first we've got to talk about our monsoon rainfall and how we're doing so far. So we were on track to be the third driest summer in Phoenix history. And here's how it breaks down month by month. So June, we don't typically get much rainfall, but in July we expect over an inch of rain and we barely got a tenth of an inch. So that set us really far back. Then for July we get about or in August, I should say, uh, we get about an inch of rain and in the last couple of days we have come close to that. So we're starting to catch up a little bit, but we've got some ground to make up. And in September, we don't typically see much more than a half inch of rain. But since the monsoon seems to be slowly starting to wake up, maybe that could change. Clouds and radar over the last six hours, you can see a little storm system that's worked its way in from Safford portions of Globe and just to our north in Prescott and Payson. And this morning we're still seeing just a band of showers that's stretching from Fountain Hills, Apache Junction, clipping portions of Mesa this morning. Cave Creek also getting a few scattered showers. And we did see in the very early morning hours a sprinkle in Chandler, Scottsdale, the Aven uh, the uh, Arcadia area, I should say. And so because of that and the cloud cover, it's helping keep our morning temperatures a little more tolerable this morning. So we've got mid 80s across much of the valley, 86 in Ahwatukee, as well as surprise 85 in Chandler and Maricopa, Santan Valley down to 83 degrees this morning and up in Anthem. 
81 degrees, so nice and comfortable out there. If you want to get out for an early morning hike, certainly now is the time to do it. And over the next two hours or so, you will notice the humidity, though it is a little sticky out there because of the storms that have been pushing through. By midday, you want to start working your way off the trail because it will be 100 degrees by lunchtime. That burn time is less than 10 minutes. So really, that's when you want to turn around. And the second half of the day, sunset is a little after 730 and will be pretty toasty at that point. Our highs today, 106 in the Deer Valley neighborhoods, Scottsdale, Mesa, Levine, Ahwatukee, and Maricopa. Anthem at 103, same temperature in Cave Creek for today. Temperatures right now across the state, we've got 80s to our south and west, so very similar conditions to what we're feeling here in the valley. A little bit cooler than that in Prescott and Payson, uh, as well as Sedona in the upper 60s, low 70s this morning. We've already warmed to 60 degrees in Flagstaff, but we're holding on to the mid 50s in Heber and 53 degrees in Window Rock this morning. But look at the warm up today. So north of the rim, we'll have some 90s in Window Rock, Heber and Sholo, triple digits in Winslow and Page, Flagstaff in the Grand Canyon staying in the 80s today. Still going to be toasty in Sedona, hitting triple digits, mid 90s in Payson, but Prescott staying in the low 90s. So maybe if you're thinking of a day trip today, that's the spot and go to one of the lakes out there to cool down. To our west, we still have very hot conditions in Mojave County, Bullhead City above 110 today, Lake Havasu coming close to that. It'll be 105 in Yuma, 104 in Casa Grande. Now, future cast showing us that later this afternoon, right around 3, 4 o'clock, we start seeing isolated thunderstorms, severe weather popping up all along the rim, stretching from the Grand Canyon on down through the White Mountains and in the Sholo area. We'll continue to see those storms fire up from there and up through northeastern Arizona, areas like Winslow and Window Rock. In the overnight hours, we'll see some isolated storm activity moving into Kingman. And in the overnight hours, that's when we could see portions of that storm kick into the north portion of the valley. But I think for the most part, it's a slight chance, and I think that it misses us this evening. But things could change tomorrow then. We up our storm chances for Sunday evening to 20% but we also up our temperature. We're back to 110 tomorrow. So all the more reason that you've got to enjoy the temperature today and the slightly cooler temperatures, because then once we get into Monday, the heat wave takes hold again. We already have excessive heat watches in effect, and they could be upgraded to heat warnings later uh, this weekend. So we'll keep our eye on that. Now talk about how long this next heat, heat wave looks to last coming up in that seven day forecast mark. That's a little later this morning. Yeah, we just got to hold on just for another month or so till we can get some cooler temperatures. All right, no, hey, thank you so much. Well, rough, that's a bit of an understatement when it comes to what businesses have been going through as they struggle during the pandemic. But many are starting to open their doors, including nail salons. But as we know, uh, nail artists, they work in very close contact with customers. That's why they've had to make some changes. ABC 15's Sonu Wasu shows us what One Valley Nail Salon is doing to keep customers and staff safe. Yeah. Put like a silver on my toes. We've been reopened now uh, since the middle of May. But they took their time. Bo Citron, vice president of operations for Pro's Nail Salon, says they wanted to make sure employees felt safe coming back to work. Safety is our top, top priority right now. Along with a good mani pedi and a new coat of polish, peace of mind is what this nail salon hopes customers experience while relaxing in one of their lounge chairs. As you can see behind me, sneeze guards that protect our consumer uh, from our um, artists. From sneeze guards to masks, all customers are also asked to wash their hands before service begins. We have the same cleaning and sterilization process on all of our tools. Speaking of tools, Citron shows us how the equipment nail artists are using undergoes what they call a medical grade sterilization system. The tools will first take a bath in a special solution that kills protein buildup. Then they'll be baked. We put them in an autoclave machine to where we bake them at 273 degrees for 30 to 45 minutes and it has a 100% sterilization. Here at Pro's Nail Salons, you can now check out, even leave a tip using their app for a seamless touchless experience. And we want to continue to be the place uh, where our consumer feels comfortable getting their manicures and pedicures. With customers trickling back in to finally get their nails done again, we are told there's a demand for nail artists. All pro salons are hiring. Sonuwasu, ABC 15, Arizona. 
All right, well, up next, how the pandemic could be impacting those with food allergies, especially those with the kids headed back to school. They're going to want to really be careful about what they choose to eat. The school year is back in session, and even if kids aren't in the classroom, districts are still providing food. But some changes made by the FDA could pose a risk to kids with food allergies. So joining us this morning is Dr. Hern Dr. Vivian Hernandez Trujillo from the Allergy and Immunology Care Center of South Florida. Dr. Hernandez Trujillo, thanks so much for joining us. It's a pleasure. Thank you for having me. So the FDA made some changes because of COVID-19. Tell me about them. There's a temporary guidance that was provided by the FDA due to disruptions in the food chain um, with, with the pandemic. So the labeling is a little bit different and a little bit lax. Um, but at the end of the day, as a parent of two girls with food allergy, and I myself am a patient with food allergy, I, I always, you know, I spend a lot of time talking to patients and families about the need not only to read labels, but regardless of whether you're eating a food that you've eaten a hundred times, when you eat a new food um, or a food that you think you've had several times, you can still have a reaction. So it's important to Number one, read the labels, and number two, just monitor the person that's eating, and, and when the children are old enough, have them, you know, and teach them. If, if something doesn't feel right, have them, um, help them verbalize, you know, something doesn't, something's not right, something's going on. So it's my understanding that according to these new guidelines, they can't make any changes to the top eight, the, the main allergens, but as you know, as you said, as a parent of kids with allergies, there are so many other nuances. So what's kind of the risk with some of the other allergens that could be changed? There's also foods from other places that may not have all the, the, the labeling that we require of, of our own products. So again, because this is an ever evolving and it really is, this pandemic has brought on things that we would have never thought could happen. Um, because it's an ever evolving field, I, I, you know, I recommend going to the FDA website and, and reading because even those recommendations recommendations may be changing from time to time. And um, the same way that that we heard this is going to be a temporary guidance and hopefully we're going to go back to the way that it was. And I think that that's important because we need to feel like we have control over a potentially, you know, life threatening situation. Right. Because something as simple as switching a peanut flour for an almond flour, a canola oil for a sunflower oil could change everything for a family. That's exactly right. It just depends on your allergens. So what do you recommend that parents do uh, when it comes to school lunches, whether they're picking them up or once we do resume in-person learning? You know, I think being prepared. So as a parent of, of children with food allergy, before the school year starts, it doesn't even matter the setting, making sure that we have our emergency action plan, the anaphylaxis action plan available, um, ensuring that we have the epinephrine auto injector. Um, and, and for anyone that may be concerned about having to go anywhere, uh, OBQ, can actually be mailed to your home, which is is something that, for a lot of people, that 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 is something that that takes away an additional worry, an additional concern, so that we are prepared in the case of an allergic reaction. Because we, you know, these are these are not only unprecedented times, but unfortunately, we can't predict when a reaction is going to happen. It, reactions happen, and unfortunately, accidents can happen. So being prepared 100% of the time, no matter what. And who do you need to tell when it comes to your, your child's classroom and the school? I'm a, a big proponent at the beginning of the school year, speaking to your, your teachers, speaking to the school nurse, if there's a school nurse, anybody in the office, it, it's going to vary again, depending on where you live. Um, and if your child may not be going back to the traditional setting, if they're going somewhere else, wherever it is that they are, whether it's with a family member or somebody that you know, that's a teacher that's going to be helping out ensuring that they know, A, how to identify that a reaction is happening, so knowing what the signs and symptoms might be, and then knowing how to administer the epinephrine auto injector. It's very important for, for preparation to be in place. Absolutely. And we know when it comes to food allergies, the devil is in the details, as they say. That's why parents religiously read those labels. So it's important to know all of these things and have a plan. Uh, Dr. Hernandez Trujillo, thank you so much for your guidance. This is such important information for all of the families that experience food allergies, and we know there are a lot of them. Thank you so much. Thank you for the opportunity to share this.